Um, so what we are going to be sharing with you today is how we designed effective pedagogy using LCT for a project for teaching critical reflection in nursing in for the Nurse School of Nursing um, at the National University of Singapore, where all of us work. So the three of us all work at the Center for English Language Communication, and um, we're going to be talking about a project that we did uh, with nursing. Um, and our big question really is about how can LCT shape pedagogy and um, how we we're going to share about how we created a rubric using um, linguistics, systemic functional linguistics and legitimation code theory frameworks for understanding linguistic resources and knowledge practices that constitute effective critical reflection practices in the discipline of nursing. So um, I'm going to I'm just going to quickly go through the introductory slides, not take up too much time because Letitia is going to be sharing to, uh, about the rubric with you so you get a really nice clear idea of the overall large project and then um, bringing in semantic gravity, Mark will be looking at more a specific part of the project and then I'll be looking at some more recent research looking at axiological constellations. Um, okay, so. So the question that we were really asking is what constitutes deep reflection in critical in clinical nursing practice. Um, the nursing lecturers at uh, the Alice Lee Center for Nursing Studies, they actually approached us because they'd seen one of our presentations on critical reflection and they wanted us to help them um, create uh, a teaching intervention to help their students to um, reflect more deeply. So this was one of those um, skills that is highly valued in nursing, but of course, it remains quite implicit. So uh, it's usually quite intuitive. Uh, the lecturers know what constitutes deep reflection, but they weren't entirely sure how to make that explicit and visible to the students. So we were involved in creating an intervention for that. And um, we went through multiple phases for the project because we also received funding for it. And um, in the first stage, we basically uh, analyzed student texts. We asked that these were based on what the lecturers had already marked. So we didn't, we weren't involved in teaching the students anything in the first stage. We were basically looking at high and mid and low scoring texts. Um, and we also had a focus group discussion with the lecturers to then discuss with them, okay, what did they think was valued in critical reflection in nursing and how um, we could help them address some of the issues in the way in which students were going about reflecting. So essentially we analyzed, um, this is the overall project, 155 scripts. We used LCT semantics and SFL, we used genre and appraisal. That was also in collaboration with the nurses. They basically told us these are some of the things that students are struggling with. Um, in their words, you know, making connections between theory and practice, the structure of texts, what does critical reflection, what do you need to do in a critical reflection and then appraisal, how do students deal with the subjective um, emotions that are part of critical reflections which surface. Um, and then we did uh, an analysis of the focus groups and from that we derived a rubric which we shared with the nurses and then we used that to inform our teaching intervention and developed a an extremely large, ambitious repository of enormous amounts of pedagogical material, um, which we use to teach the students selected parts that we use to teach the students. So what is the critical reflection task that the students were required to do? Um, so these are undergraduate students, they're going on their first clinical place placements, and they're asked to do what's called fundamentals of nursing. So fundamentals of nursing are things like assisted bathing, um, taking vital signs for the first time, checking blood pressure, etc. They're doing these kinds of activities in front of clinical instructors and with their other cohort of um, nursing students. Uh, so it's a very a high stress environment for the students. It's also very emotional because they're engaging with their patients' bodies for the first time. So they're doing things like dressing wounds and they're really um, dealing with the patients at a really vulnerable point in their lives. So there's a lot of emotional... Um, and subjective uh, encounters that, that take place in clinical practice. And for the nursing staff, critical reflections were about giving the students an opportunity to move back from that and think about that situation in a more objective manner. So to engage with the feelings, but then think about, okay, um, what did the feelings allow me to do? What did it hinder me from doing? And how well did I perform in that particular instance or not? So the students have to reflect on their own actions. Um, as well as other participants like their fellow students and clinical instructors, uh, what were they doing well and not so well. And um, they need to try and link these to theoretical frameworks. So what they learned in the classroom about what was considered 
proper, accepted and appropriate practice uh, in the context of nursing. So this is the uh, sort of Gibbs reflective cycle. For anyone who's familiar with the critical reflection, critical thinking uh, frameworks, this is quite a popular uh, framework. I, that's used to scaffold students through the process of reflection. So students are supposed to describe what happened, share their feelings, evaluate the experience, then comes the analysis, the conclusion, and um, then they're supposed to talk about what they would do if they could have the same experience, but you know what they could do better. What have they learned from reflecting on this particular experience? So the nurses shared this with the students, but um, they said, nonetheless, that there were quite a few gaps in terms of what the students were producing. So what they were mentioned already uh, sort of reflects what's in the larger critical reflection research out there in higher education, which is that students are predominantly descriptive. They'll just focus on what's happened. Uh, there'll be no attempt at deep reflection, but that's partly also because what constitutes deep reflection is so hard to get your hands on. And um, there's no attempt to try and uh, link their practice with theory. So the lecturers basically said in the focus group discussion, they said, you know, when you reflect, you can't just look back and remember. You need you put your thought processes into it. You have to have an outcome. There has to be analysis taking place, uh, whether it's reflection or critical reflection. The goal is the same to analyze and make sense of events. So our question really was, um, how do we uncover the knowledge practices that emerge when you're making sense of these events? And how can we make that explicit and model that back to the students so that they know what's expected of them so that they can really use this uh, opportunity to you know, create good, deep quality reflections. So I'm just going to now pass on to Letitia. So I'm gonna stop sharing. I'll come back at the end and dazzle you with the finale. Um, and before <laughs> before you hand open, uh, Namali, can I just, can I just invite stroke passively bully Lucy into asking you a question? Sure. Sure, like a live rendition. We can That's do right. that. Yeah, Greetings please. everyone from Auckland. Um, Namari, I'm just thinking about your what you've done in social work mm -hmm. and what you learned about um, the kind of critique that students were expected to do. Mm. Is Was this similar in that the critical reflection needed to be some negative self-assessment or was it more balanced? Okay, so I'm thrilled you asked that question because okay. I think I went in quite cynical into the project because I saw that a lot of students were being performative in their critical reflections and the performance was based on negative self-judgment and then showing some sort of contrition coming out the other end to say that they're, they're amazingly transformed now. Yeah. But in this particular discipline, I found that it was... First of all, the nursing lecturers were very straightforward about the fact that students could talk about what they did well, and mm -hmm. students do do that. And they and students share things that are, I thought would typically be frowned upon. Like they'll share things like something that they did that was unethical, like um, you know, writing down a wrong calculation when they're taking a blood pressure because they were under so much pressure to get it right and they weren't sure, but they knew what the stats should be. So they were, it was, they were setting it, I think the way they set up the task and the fact that the students knew the value of it, because I think in nursing, it's such a, that there's so much tension in that first clinical placement and the students felt free enough to share that. So we felt really that it was a genuine sort of a more authentic experience than the social work students. So I'm just going to, when I share my um, last few slides and I look at the constellation, you see it's a positive, the student starts positively talking about what they did well and then showing what they could have done better. So it was much more empowering, I think, for the students and for us as teachers as well. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy. I want to come in here as well, please. Um, yeah, sure. Sorry, I'm just okay. Um, so, a, a, a an analysis of the reflections of student teachers in their practical. Um, we also had used Gibbs cycle to set up the kind of the prompts, the research mm. prompt, the, the question prompts that we asked them to to look at. But when we actually saw why is it that they they're so descriptive. Why is it that they're not going to um, making links with their theory? All that the questions actually did was focusing them on their immediate um, 
yeah. situation and context mm -hmm. as if you know the work-based context is completely separate um, to anything that they've learned in their formal studies so yeah. we actually had to then um, um, re reformulate the questions but not using gibbs but and so i'm really interested to see what your your study shows in terms of of that but we actually found that the problem was was to a large extent located in that gibbs framework mm -hmm. uh, yeah a huge yeah. amount of the Gibbs framework focuses on that on the practice and the immediate situation and then yeah. jump to analysis now analyze so, because it's so it's so simple to use with students mm -hmm. right it's just guiding questions that will just in a way give them the illusion okay i know i know what to do now what to do next but in fact it kind of uh, hides what they're supposed to be doing the next part yeah. is exactly about this lee oh <laughs> fantastic okay I'm, yeah i'm just interested <laughs> to see how because i think that we we facing very similar similar um challenges mm -hmm. you know thank you i i refer to you uh in a minute, actually, Lee, because I was at the round table, you did a couple of, um, no, the, the, uh, not the previous one, the one before, on the uh, teacher training one. Yes. So okay. uh, thank you. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to see <laughs> you inspired. <us. laughs> okay. So, um, so I'm going to talk about the work we did on the, on the rubric. And um, so why starting with the rubric? since it seems to be the kind of outcome of the project we were kind of asked can you do a rubric and you revise our rubrics can you help us teach this um, but in fact because it's such an important um, document um, we thought we'd talk about it in this round table first because it kind of structured the the, the project um, and so yes uh, lee in your in your round table you called rubrics structuring structures and as I listened to this, I just submitted a chapter and I thought, damn, that was such a good idea to call it like this, because really the, the rubric is shaped by the, the, the people, the field uh, who are designing it. And then as a, as a result, it then shapes how the, the reflection skill is going to be uh, taught, how it's going to be assessed. So it's a really crucial uh, um, um, document. Um, and um, I think that's what you were saying, you know, if it's not designed with theory in mind, no analysis of students' work, uh, if it's not aligned with what is taught, or, or even worse, if it guides uh, uh, teaching that is not really effective, um, then in the end, uh, instead of revealing, it, it ends up dissimulating the, um, the basis of achievement. Um, and in the literature on uh, analytical rubrics, a, a lot of it is on kind of um, measuring uh, reliability of raters uh, or, you know, using those kind of things that we hate here in, uh, I mean, among us three, uh, like rush programs or things like that, where you just kind of police the raters, you tell them you know, you're not using the rubric properly, but you never go back to the actual beginning of, uh, of the design of the rubric by thinking, you know, are we populating those cells properly? So we thought we would um, look at those three main elements in order to design an anal analytical rubrics that might be helpful, basing it completely on student assignments, so through analysis of different uh, performance, using uh, robust uh, uh, theoretical frameworks that can really help make visible uh, what the students are supposed to be doing, so we used elements of LCT and SFL, and also the dialogue with the experts. Um, so. So we started, the, one of our first meetings with the nursing lecturers were about um, looking at their existing rubric. And so you can have a look here, they kind of followed the Gibbs uh, cycle, which is how they taught the, the, the skill of, uh, of reflecting. So you have the description of the encounter, the, the feeling, the, the evaluation, the plan uh, of action. So some, they really tried hard to make things visible to the students, but at the same time, there were a lot of those uh, much vaguer kind of concepts like, you know, sophisticated understanding or display independent learning, display self-awareness, um, main points are well justified in what way, we don't know. So they tried as much as they could, but what is highlighted in kind of grey purplish there is, is a bit what the, 
the lecturers themselves weren't very um, completely sure about. Right? They they had a very intuitive way of uh, of um, of viewing these things, but weren't kind of uh, able to to explain it to students. So that was the the basic the start of the the project. Um, and so when we started analyzing the papers, um, it was fairly obvious. And as uh, Nam said, those three things were really uh, uh, um, um, kind of troubling the lecturers. The fact that um, in terms of goals and, and purpose of the text, students weren't completely clear, the, the staging of the text, um, who to evaluate, how to talk about emotions and opinions, all this was quite challenging. And, and one of the biggest problem was using theory uh, and practice or, or, or weaving the two together. So we analyzed those uh, papers with this. Very briefly, I'll take you, uh, take you through the genre analysis. Um, so with the genre analysis, we were just looking at um, uh, the broader context, the social purpose of the text and how this shows through um, language resources at the whole text, the paragraph and the, and the sentence uh, level. And so we were asking these types of questions um, so what, what is the subject matter? Or how is it? Or how is the text organized? What are the types of relations, evaluations, um, and so on? So the first question: What is the social purpose of the text? I thought I would tell you about this because I, I thought it was quite interesting. In the focus group, we asked the lecturers: So, what's the goal of that text? And so they had two kind of responses. The first one was really on the critical reflection assignment for the students. And it was really for them through writing reflections through the program, it would cultivate and scaffold a lifelong professional skill, which they won't have really a lot of time to do once they are in their profession. There's no more kind of sitting down and writing a diary at the end of the very long shift. Um, and interestingly, some of the lecturers were saying, we also want them as general goal of critical reflection for the profession, to be confident, to be knowledgeable, um, to of course uh, 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 pre um, um, implement their the, the care uh, uh, effectively, but also to impact their professional status. And that was quite interesting because the 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 school here is the only one um, providing degrees in in nursing and masters and and, and higher. The rest in Singapore are, are just do, doing diplomas. So there was this idea of keeping their status as well when, once they are in the in the clinical uh, uh, practice field. Um, and also there was a degree of protecting their their, uh, their status as well in, in terms of workload and, and having being more able to defend themselves uh, once in the in the field. And that was quite strongly felt in the focus group that you had those very experienced uh, nurses in a very limited kind of field, like Singapore is such a small, and you could see them kind of equipping them for being the next generation that will shape the, um, the practices. Um, so in the literature, how do we answer the same question? What's the goal? What are the stages? Um, Nessie and Garner have a, um, a kind of a genre family where they talk about the different um, uh, elements of the text. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, Shenes, Tidikaratna, and Maiten. You have this uh, uh, um, chapter on in the. Uh, it was uh, critical thinking. <laughs> I think it's Routledge, but I'm not sure anymore. Um, which looked at uh, um, the the stages as well, the um, uh, the genre analysis. So we followed this, and found. So these are the results we found. Generally, introduction orientation, critical inc incident, excavation, and transformation, which um, we have the purpose here in the middle column. So a general, a lot more precise description of the setting, the event that triggers the reflection. We couldn't keep the term critical incident because in nursing that means something else. And so they weren't happy with that. <laughs> so we, uh, uh, in the documents for the nurses, we had to call it, um, I, I don't know, Okay. I can't remember what we called it anymore. Um, Nam, if you or Mark, if you remember later, you can tell me. Um, I think it's a problematic incident, right? We had to it critical because it meant that somebody was going to die. Yeah, that was a yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, excavation uh, is about the unpacking and the uh, um, making the the thinking visible. This is what the lecturers were saying. 
we want to see their, their thinking. That's what we like to do, a uh, uh, reading. Uh, and then the transformation. So one thing, and then Coda is the, is the end that didn't all have that. Um, one thing that, one first kind of learning point for the nurses and for us here was that um, transformation was um, actually not very um, developed in either the weak papers or the stronger papers. I'm gonna show you the comparison now. Um, in the transformation, generally in the low achieving papers, it was hardly there or very general and not precisely related, just more as a, what you were saying, I'm just a performance. I will be much better uh, next time. But even in the very high achieving papers, it wasn't very developed either. And so that kind of, we kind of wondered why. And with the nursing lecturers, we thought, well, because they are year one. And so, you know, the Gibbs cycle kind of seems to be giving equal weighting to all of these questions. But in fact, in practice and across a, a whole kind of four year degree, the weighting has to change. Uh, a year one uh, student after their first clinical uh, uh, placement has really little kind of uh, idea how to project themselves in the professional uh, um, world. So, so that were, there were so many interesting things like this where, where the nurses were learning something and we were learning something. It was uh, quite, quite interesting. So that gave them the idea to then probably uh, uh, work on different rubrics throughout the, the four years and adjust the weighting and the descriptions. Okay, so this is uh, one of the, yeah, the rubrics once it was revised. Um, we had to keep the Gibbs cycle because um, when they gave us feedback on the, on the rubrics, they, they felt a little bit, um, I think a little bit, the change was going to be too much. And so they thought, let's anchor it still on the Gibbs cycle because the lecturers will adopt it more easily. So we did this and we kept the stages and then described it using uh, um, uh, semantic gravity and evaluations, which you'll hear about in a minute. Uh, this is the longer version for the uh, uh, teachers with descriptions at competent functional and initial um, performance. The second page. And so, yeah, that made us really think about uh, when Patricia. you change. Yes, yeah, sorry. Sorry, what's what, competent functional initial? Oh, yes. Yeah, so, so these were, yeah. So the, the lecturers wanted to call it this, the nursing lecturers. Competent means it's uh, uh, achieving or exceeding the, the requirements. Functional, okay. it's doing, doing okay. And initial, it's, um, mm. yeah. So it's like kind of a, a positive way of, uh, of phrasing. Uh, Good, things. okay, crap. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, which was closer to our suggestion, but it didn't work. All right. So with this, um, once we'd done this, we uh, created uh, some online materials to deliver for, uh, to the students and to the lecturers. So in that online pack, there are PowerPoint presentations. Uh, there's uh, examples of very uh, you know, detailed analysis of the uh, um, two sample scripts. Um, and so again, always highlighting those three elements that guided our analysis, the, the genre, the uh, um, evaluation and semantic ways. Um, there are two readings as well. And then we did two training sessions uh, on Zoom for, for students uh, and for lecturers. So I'll show you an example of, that was uh, the training session for the students. So, so here we're really like looking at recontextualizing all of those ideas to deliver to the students. So you can recognize there's, um, there's semantic uh, gravity with explanation and uh, uh, labeling of samples. There's the stages, there's sharing emotions with highlighting the, the targets and so on. So this is what the students received. I mean, it's, it's more than that, but just to show you. Um, and so the students took that uh, kind of short online pack and then a Zoom session. And then the next stage will be to uh, collect their reflections and to actually look at the impact of, uh, of the intervention. Uh, and this is just other samples from the, um, uh, the online pack, I think. So again, um, text analysis. And I think, yeah, I think that's it for me. And another one here for appraisal. Um, okay, yeah. That's all for me. And 
Mark is going to tell us about uh, so a more detailed analysis using semantic gravity, which then helped us, of course, to write the rubric and the um, um, and the materials. Mark, do I mean, you want to uh, share? Yeah. Before you jump ahead, having several presenters is really helpful because it means you get like a quick chance to jump in. So I was, I was wondering about whether some people who, when they come to LCT, they they're used to just a lot of prose and waffle metaphors and hand waving, and they get they they. I've seen people say, for example, on on the edu Twitterverse in the UK, oh, teachers always or students always roll their eyes when you say something like semantic gravity. You can't use a term like that. Uh, it's far too technical. They don't deal with it. Um, you know, were you, did you find that or did you, did, were, you, were you tempted to not use that? No, not at all, actually. No, no, no. Um, what you've just seen there was exactly, no, no, I think the students really like it, actually. It shows them something that they didn't know. And it's not difficult to, to, to understand. It can be recontextualized in a simple enough manner. No, 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 it's not. Um, I mean, usually those criticisms come from another kind of reason. Not, not, it's not a genuine concern about poor students can't work it out. It's the same in SFL. We do. The meta language is supposed to be, you know, something we shouldn't use. Well, one um, of the great things about using a term like semantic gravity is that it indicates to the listener, to the reader, to the student, this is a term with precise meaning. We have now entered a technical realm. You are being taught something. There's a tool here. So it's kind of like, it doesn't slip back into some sort of everyday common sense meaning. You're actually signaling through a use like semantic gravity. It's clearly not an everyday term. It's not like, you know, something that you can just like um, mistake for something else. And so a lot of people who come from particular codes and particular semantic ranges will go, that puts them off, that's alienating, that's cold, that's too scientific or whatever. But I also find with students in my experience anyway, that they go, Oh, good. There's something that I'm learning. There's something that I, I'm actually. Oh, and by the way, I'm getting my money's worth here because I'm now being taught something. Yes, um, Carl. Can I add that also? I think for the students, they can see that they can transfer it. That's what we're ultimately going for. Can you use the same analytical tool in your next assignment or another similar assignment to look at the exact same thing and the the way that you're dealing with, you know, uh, complex concepts in your discipline and more concrete. Uh, concepts in your discipline and practice, etc. So I think that they really value it. We certainly don't have that kind of attitude here. And even with the nursing lecturers, they were very, they were fine with as soon as we explained the term to them, showed them how it worked, they were very happy to use it. So that was very exciting for us. And critical thinking is such a waffly, that's the exact mm. kind of waffly area of research that you're talking about, endless terminology, which nobody knows exactly what it means and studies that say things like it's intuitive, which is another way of saying we haven't really thought about it, we haven't worked it out and we can't be bothered because it's gonna take too long. So we're just gonna say, you, if you know what it is, you know what it is, if you don't, too bad, so. I, I could just add to that as well. Um, you know, I find that my students find semantic gravity waving, you know, very useful and they actually link it to their own disciplines as well, because, you know, whether it's engineering or life science or, or another discipline like that, STEM wise, um, they're asked to write for an audience who might not be specialists in the field. So when you start talking about semantic gravity waving and how to, you know, look at those different levels of, of context dependency, what you're really doing is unpacking theory for, for readers. So they actually find it's a very useful tool. Yeah. Okay, so shall I carry on then? All right. Please do, okay. please do. Okay, thank you. So my, my role in the research team was to um, explore how semantic gravity might shed light on um, the way that we're going to train the, the lecturers to teach the nursing students and also the, you know, how, how it might help the nursing students demonstrate their capacity to critically reflect on and learn from their practicum experiences. Um, so this is a, a citation that I'm sure everyone 
um, has read before and probably cited. Um, as you know, enacting semantic gravity uh, is exploring how meanings are more or less related to context. And so for our purposes, um, meaning at the weaker end of, of the semantic gravity continuum uh, might be talking about general principles um, related to patient care, for example, and um, something towards the stronger semantic gravity end of the continuum might be a, a student nurse describing um, how she or he conducted an assisted shower with, a, with an actual patient. Um, and so we found that um, semantic gravity was very useful uh, for exploring both the experiential and the textual meanings. Um, so how um, you know, the subject matter was explored and also how the, um, the cohesion in the text uh, was constructed. So um, as, as Namala and Letitia have already said, um, we didn't just analyze nurses, uh, student nurse texts, but we also conducted um, some focus group discussions. So we did two separate focus groups and uh, each focus group had five or six participants and um, they were from the Alice Lee Center for Nursing Studies. They were all lecturers. And uh, we picked out some important discourse from the focus groups that can be enacted by the semantic gravity code. So that the first is the notion of cumulative rather than segmented learning. So here you can see the focus group participant refers to linking experiences together to go beyond the unique context to provide more generalizable uh, and cumulative learning. And uh, here's another extract from uh, a focus group. Here the lecturer states um, that the paper only describes what happened on day one and then only describes what happens on day two. And so for low scoring papers, um, you know, they were consistently um, doing this. We found that there were mainly up or down escalators uh, representing segmented learning. And you can see that the actual focus group discussion talks about this too. Um, moreover, very often there were only two levels of meaning. Um, so there was the unique contextual at the SG plus uh, range and then shifting quickly to context independent or the abstract to depict general principles of practice. Um, but we found also that at this SG minus level, the, um, the actual engagement was fairly simplistic um, and normally only tied to one particular context predominantly. So uh, in, in this slide, you can see uh, what we mean as we provide some extracts from a low scoring paper. So you can see that at the start of the reflection, the focus is very context specific. So meaning towards SG plus, talking about, um, you know, medication that was unattended. And then after that, the student nurse uh, goes into the reflection by discussing general principles about dealing with medication. So towards the SG minus range. However, you can see from the engagement that it is, you know, quite everyday language where there could have been a technicality if, um, you know, if the student had uh, explored the faculty input um, or even her um, clinical instructor's input a bit more. So um, the, um, the low scoring papers can be really enacted as two separate um, up escalators and shifting from incidents from a more general, um, from, from a very contextual or very general to, um, to produce segmented learning. And um, this, this is what, um, an example of, of what we found here. 
Um, so you can see two separate up escalators. This, this paper received 41 out of 60. And you can see that the student starts on both um, describing two accounts and describing the incident. And then after that, trying to link it uh, to some more uh, context independent evaluations but with no, what we found was no real excavation um, and no real um, transformative learning shown. So very descriptive and then a kind of lens to analyze, but with little um, transformative learning, what, what we've called uh, transformative learning based on the genre analysis. However, for the, for the higher scoring papers, uh, we saw a lot of levels of meaning. And again, um, from the, even from the focus groups, we were, we were told this by the lecturers. Um, here with the lecturer states, we have many layers. When you reflect, you put your thought processes into it. And so they're really talking about applying knowledge. Uh, and this was consistently referred to by participants in the focus groups. Um, and they also talked about the um, reflections having an outcome. So again, this is talking about a transformative uh, learning based on uh, the application of knowledge to practice. So in the focus groups, the two um, knowledge sources for learning most mentioned were input from the faculty and input from the clinical instructor, uh, who is the nurse's mentor. Uh, also referred to as the preceptor in, in the uh, discipline. So here are some extracts from a high scoring paper. So um, at the start, the nurse, um, you can see is actually formally naming the activities now. So assisted bath and assessment skills compared to the low scoring paper. And she, he or she is talking about how these were performed with reference to various aspects of what's called the Entrustable Professional Activities, the EPA guideline. This is um, general principles of practice that nurse students need to learn. And you can also see highlighted many levels of analysis in line with the focus group participants comments. So the student talks about my experience. So the individual nurses contextual learning also talks about nursing practice more generally. So what, what we've termed, um, what we've termed, what we said might be called the every nurse kind of experience. You can see that the student in the reflection refers to the clinical instructor or the practicum expert. Um, the student refers to Lynn 2010, so a, an academic reference. And she also refers to another essential guide, the code for nurses and midwives. And um, so you can see hopefully from that, that there are different levels of reflection. And we can enact the data from the high scoring paper. So it got 56 out of 60, this, this particular one. And um, using semantic gravity, we can produce a, you know, a more complex profile than the up escalators or the down escalators that we tended to see in the low scoring papers. So to, to start in the reflection, there was, um, this is following the, the genre um, um, stages that that we've developed that, that Letitia was talking about. So to, to start in the reflection, there was a, a general orientation at the, the weakest semantic gravity end of the continuum, during which the student nurse first referenced these entrustable professional activities, stating that she'd um, experienced firsthand the importance of having such guidelines for a variety of contexts during her practicum but that she was going to share one particular incident for this reflection. Thus from the outset, she's preparing the reader for more, more generalizable, transferable learning. And then after that, she describes or he describes the context or, or incident uh, 
So meaning towards SG+, plus, which was being asked to conduct an assisted shower with an elderly patient who um, had fractured limbs. So the student nurse describes her emotions uh, and she describes her actions, how she escorted the patient into the bathroom. Uh, she also describes how she was reflecting at that time, how would I undress the patient without causing pain? Uh, she then discusses the challenges she faced with the lack of space in the bathroom. And then moving towards the SG minus range, she begins to really excavate the, the experience. So she talks about in, in hindsight, how she uh, can generalize now about how even the simplest of situations requires effective reflection uh, prior to and during the event. And that only through practice and the development of a systematic approach in such situations learned from guidelines and experience can a nurse really keep her cool and analyze the specifics of each context? And she talks about how this led her to acknowledge that for a neophyte, it's essential to learn the guidelines for expertise. And then after that, she returned to the SG meanings to sum up both her positive and negative experiences. Um, she talks about uh, she may have caused the patient slight pain, but she managed to clean her effectively without too much discomfort. And then after that, she shifts or he shifts to the transformation and reveals how at the time the clinical instructor said that she might encourage the elderly lady to shower herself, advice which she could have taken. Um, she also reports on an academic source that I mentioned, Lynn, 2010, and how um, you know, she could have perhaps tried bed sponging. So she reveals how through experiences, you know, she's realized the importance of evidence-based learning. And then the transformation or the coder at the end is, is stating, you know, that it's important uh, to have a combination of academic and practical knowledge uh, to produce a sophisticated professional disposition and how from this learning cycle, she feels more prepared for similar future situations. So quite a complex reflection. And um, based on the, the data that we enacted using semantic gravity, we've summed up um, using a translation device in table form here uh, with indicators and examples from empirical data so um, the weaker SG meanings might be termed, as I said, the every nurse narrative um, on the um, general level based on professional guidelines. <laughs> and then perhaps we might talk about a nurse in person narrative, which is more um, generalizable as well. This is what I'll do in future, perhaps. This is what, uh, this, these are my um, activities um my my learning from my activities for future events and then after that we saw um knowledge from the clinical instructor which again can be at both um generalizable levels or more specific contextual levels and then after that moving to the sg plus range um hypotheses in the past so what would i do and then also um, to the most SG plus, perhaps actual description and feelings and events. Um, so yeah, that's that's how I worked with semantic gravity. Um, yeah. Thank you. I just asked uh, Mark, um, did you? I mean, you, you obviously found it useful. Obviously, uh, what would what was the uh, what did you find most useful about it? If, I mean, um, in terms of um, what would you say that you could perhaps see that you might not have otherwise done? Such as I think you mentioned. I'm not don't want to lead you, but I remember you saying some of the lines of um, you know you could see um, different things as being stronger semantic gravity, for example, or sharing some attribute that they might not be clearly sharing if you kind of parse them into what they're about. So, you know, this one's emotional, this one's very descriptive contextually or something like that. 
So um, it, it really, using semantic gravity really helps to show, make visible the complexity of good reflections um, and all the different levels of meanings that, that exist. Um, and, I, and I think that, you know, even before we talked about semantic gravity in the focus groups, the lecturers from, from the nursing centre were talking about this. Um, and, and we hadn't even mentioned semantic gravity at that stage. And so the weaker papers, you know, were, were very simplistic. Uh, and if you do enact the data using semantic gravity, you, you can easily see um, how they're shifting from, you know, very just uh, main, mainly polar kind of meaning. So one very descriptive and then one I'll try to evaluate it uh, using, you know, the official, the official uh, source. Um, but, but these kinds of um, reflections were, were downplayed a lot by the lecturers, whereas the ones that were complicated, that were bringing in all these different levels of meaning, were the ones that were valued the most. And it, it was very interesting to see how semantic gravity really enacted that, that data, really helped to show the differences. That's cool. Andrea has a question for you as well. Hi, Andrea. Yes, yes thank you. Um, well, when I was looking through your presentation, I actually, I'm actually thinking a lot about the investigation that one of my colleagues from LCT Mexico is carrying, is carrying out. It's very similar to what you're doing because he's also working on nursing text, but he's trying to make explicit the values in nursing and other healthcare sciences. So, and what he's saying that this type of practices actually demand an integral type of knowledge that has conceptual attitude and axiological knowledge. And um, well, I'm finding a lot of links with your investigation and I'm going to talk with him a lot about what you are doing. But what I'm thinking um, is that when I see that the students, they don't know how to, how to carry out this kind of deep reflection I wonder if they are not thinking of themselves as knowers, as if they see themselves as separate entities from the practice and the theory. Like they're like, um, I'm just like receiving, I'm just, um, I don't know how to say this. It's going to be a lot of hand waving at this point of time. So I'm so sorry about that. Okay. So um, okay. I'm thinking that these students die, like they just think of themselves like very passive, in this type of in this type of practices and um, well what and i'm thinking if you also talked about approaching this research with the specialization code or any other type of perspective and that's it thank you so um we we haven't um we haven't published using specialization as a code um not yet but but I think we definitely we definitely could see applications for specialization as well in our findings. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that would be useful for the training as well of, of the student nurses and the lecturers. It's very interesting what you're saying about the students not seeing themselves as a, as a knowers or legitimate knowers yet. And maybe that is a matter of evolution over a program. But if you make those um, those elements yeah, visible to them, it can help them to, to um, you know, to adopt the kind of um, um, evaluation pa patterns and so on that show them as, a, as legitimate knowers. I think that Namala, that's really what you are talking about next. <laughs> Sounds a nice little <laughs> squiggly. Yeah, I might um, just share my screen. Just very quickly. Okay. So that is exactly what I'm going to be looking at next. Um, I'll just skip forward from here to my section. Um, so I'm going to be looking at axiological constellations and how students try to uh, align themselves with professional values in nursing. So I'm looking at exactly what you were talking about, I think. Um, so different from Mark and Letitia, Mark and Letitia were looking at uh, the development of the rubric and then just a snapshot of how 
we um, looked at semantic gravity uh, and used semantic gravity really to unpack how students were engaging with um, different types of knowledge in their critical reflections. I'm going to be looking at something a little bit newer that I'm doing. So this is, you know, I'm going to put the little disclaimer about work in progress. Um, so I'd really be interested to see if you can all see what I'm um, trying to map out here using constellations, axiological constellations to try and reveal how the professional values of nursing are presented and how the student tries to align with that. So I'm only looking at one um, sort of high scoring student sample because I mean the high scoring student samples were really amazing for us to read I think because they just were such rich sources of data and they revealed so much about the discipline and the way in which they align themselves with the discipline. So the reason why I went into axiological constellations was because initially when I was looking at evaluative meaning I started with appraisal and I was just looking at appraisal. This is a, this is a little extract of the text that um, Letitia was showing you. Just looked at appraisal. How were the students using it? Which parts of the text were they using it in? And were they using it effectively or not? So for instance, there were certain patterns that emerged that were really obviously considered good use of evaluative meaning and bad use of evaluative meaning from the perspective of the nursing lecturers. So students, for instance, who would criticize other nursing staff and other students and reflect on their performance, for instance, um, was, was undervalued or, or not considered very valued uh, types of critical reflection. So that was just an isolated, okay, in each stage, critical incident, excavation and transformation, how are students deploying evaluative meanings? Don't even look at it in such detail, Andrea, I'm moving on from this because I wanna say that for me, what I realized was that I needed something more there. So and in enter axiological constellations and how I went into clusters to try and reveal more about what was happening in terms of the discipline. So one of the things that emerges from the focus group data th that I think was really valuable was that um, nursing lecturers said that in nursing, you need to see the patient as a person and holistically manage the person and not just the case, okay? So a really strong NOAA perspective coming in, um, social relations, and then they, they balance that out with the, you wanna manage the patient in terms of having the knowledge to manage, knowing the rationale behind different interventions. So they're bringing in the knowledge and they're bringing in the epistemic relations. So it's a really, it's one of those disciplines in which the nursing lecturers themselves are very aware of the fact that there's this balance and they're, they're aware that that exists. Um, and it comes from a sort of canonical papers like Carper's 1978 Fundamentals of Nursing, in which Carper makes a distinction between empirics and um, aesthetics. So she makes a clear distinction between the science of nursing and she says that's one aspect of it, the knowledge. And then she says, but there's also the art of nursing, the empathy, um, personal knowledge in nursing, you know, rejecting the client as an objective, um, just the case, moving to an authentic personal relationship, moral knowledge in nursing. So it's really interesting because they're already seeing their knowledge in relation to um, epistemic and social relations. And uh, this feeds into the way in which things like core competencies in nursing are um, structured or, or created. So in Singapore, the Singapore Nursing Board has this thing called, this huge document called Core Competencies in Nursing in which they lay out what a Singaporean registered nurse should have as a minimum set of standards of performance, right? So what are the qualities, attributes and skills? And they define competency as three things, necessary knowledge, skills and attitudes, okay? Um, and they basically say a nurse must possess these in order to perform a defined set of activities to an expected standard. And um, then they have a section called management of care. And of the, under these, they have sort of, you know, demonstrating effective communication, ensuring, ensuring holistic uh, quality of care, maintaining safe environment. Now, these three points are what the students are expected to demonstrate their capacity to operationalize when they get into clinical placements. So they're supposed to show how they use effective communication for better patient outcomes, how they ensure that the patients get consistent and continued holistic quality of care, etc. And the high scoring students are really competent at um, sort of engaging with these kinds of discourses. Really abstract, it seemed to me, demonstrating effective communication. So it's really a question of them trying to apply those abstract principles to their individual um, clinical uh, 
clinical practice situations. So how do they go about doing that? So as I see underlying all of the um, practices that they engage in and um, the, the sort of cosmology maybe, I think, of nursing competency in the fields that's accepted and, and um, valued, there's nursing competency consists of knowledge, attitude, and skills. But each individual student sort of builds up a whole bunch of evaluative meanings, clusters of evaluative meaning that then they um, use to create a larger constellation in which they try to align with these concepts of nursing competency. So that's what I'm going to try and show. This is what it looks like when you unpack just one of the uh, critical reflections. So what is nursing competency? It's types of attitudes. So this is from a student's text. A nurse has to be meticulous and careful. They have to have certain types of knowledge, all right? So I will look at this in a little bit more detail so you know what I mean. So knowledge means bad things can happen to patients and you have to help avoid them. So for instance, patients can be fall risks. And what does that mean in relation to specific types of um, specific theories and knowledge that they are given in their disciplines. And then there's a sense of skills in terms of what do you need to do to manage that risk for your patient? How do you create a safe environment? So this is just showing you in a very abstract way how the student creates this constellation of nursing competence. Now I'm just going to break that down a little bit and look at that in a little bit more detail. So for me, first of all, I didn't start with that. That is what I ended up with when I started to analyze the text in relation to clusters of meaning. So for clusters, for me, it was really uh, going back to mine and Esther's paper where we were trying to think of what is an axiological cluster for us. Uh, we said target plus evaluation. So just to give you an example, if we see a repeated um, attitudinal meanings clustering together, the same pattern, then we basically say, okay, that's a single cluster. So for instance, in a text, if the student nurses are consistently saying that they are unable to speak hockey and competently, so this is an instance in which the student's talking about the effective communication. They're not competent communicators because they, can't, they don't share the same language with um, their patient and they find it really difficult to understand. This is a whole cohort struggling to understand what the patient is telling them. And as a result, there's a compromise of the patient's care. And so they negatively judge their capacity. Um, so that is a cluster that emerges in, a, in one of these texts. Now I'm gonna show you how the cluster of nursing knowledge develops in the excavation stage. So, um, so the student basically is looking at, so just to give you a context of the specific clinical placement, the student is engaged in assisted bathing and the patient is completely non-compliant. The patient doesn't want to do anything that the student asks them to do, um, and, but it's still a fall risk, has weak legs and is unable to like, uh, hold themselves up. And the student is very worried that because the patient isn't complying, that they are actually going to have a fall. So then the student, after they narrate this particular incident in the critical incident stage, in the excavation, they've taken time to go back to the literature and think about what are the implications of falls for the, um, for the patients. So this is generalized nursing knowledge. So this is what um, Mark was talking about when he said, you know, every nurse generalized knowledge. So the student is saying, okay, so I know now that falls can have severe complications for elderly patients. They can suffer from head injuries and fractures, confined to a wheelchair, prolonged hospitalization, higher healthcare costs, lower quality of life, hip fractures can mean 18 months of recovery time, one in four will completely lose their independence. So they're building up a little cluster of um, knowledge about what constitutes negative impact for their patients. So in, in, in each instance, they're evaluating the same thing. They're basically talking about the impact on the patient. So severe complications, suffer from head injuries, confined to a wheelchair. And they're talking about this little cluster that's building up in relation to risk management for falls in the discipline of nursing. Then it's all negatively charged. So that's the little snapshot of um, falls, which comes at the bottom of my constellation. So this is just to give you an example of where I started and then show you how I ended up. But when I was, so this is the, the next diagram is I think what's 
what's really going to do everyone's heads in, um, which is when I was thinking about, okay, so this is where the students want to end up. They want to be a competent nurse who's uh, meticulous and careful. They're able to maintain a safe environment. And they do this by acknowledging, okay, I know what complications can result to my patients because of falls and I'm going to do everything I can to reduce the, the chance that my patient is going to fall. And then they basically say, okay, one of the ways of doing this, and this is what um, Letitia was talking about earlier, this idea that the students transformation, the section where they're talking about what would I have done, what could I do, is not necessarily very well formed. So here the student just has a little, I felt I could improve by asking for non non skid mats available, non slip mats available. That's basically all they have as a specific thing that they could do to prevent the patient's falls. Um, but you can see that they're focusing primarily on what constitutes nursing competence. So what makes a good nurse in terms of attitudes and knowledge and how do they show that they can align to that? So this constellation was really interesting for me because initially when the students start in the critical incident stage, which is the nurse in person narrative, they start off by saying, this is what I did. I locked the commode, placed the grab bars within reach and laid his dirty clothes on the floor. Right. I found the patient frustrating, so I had to be more attentive and more caring. That's where I started. So I think going back to Lucy's earlier question, it's interesting because this student isn't necessarily saying I did something bad or wrong and I'm going to fix it. Um, they're more saying, OK, this is what I did under the circumstances. This is what I could manage to do in order to maintain a safe environment. However, I'm aware that there are more professional ways of um engaging you know making sure this patient doesn't um fall and then they explain what those are when they're referring to their transform skills and in order to do this they need to move through the excavation they need to engage with all of the things that are considered maintaining a safe environment in relation to the the singapore nursing board document on core competencies and part of doing that is to demonstrate their knowledge, demonstrate the, the appropriate generalized every nurse attitude, and then they can talk about transforming. So it was um, a movement through the different stages ending up in transformed practice, um, which is what I've tried to show here. Different from some of the other students, there will be students who, the, the example I showed you of the cluster where the student talks about the fact that they didn't know how to speak Hokkien, what they do is something slightly different. They actually create oppositional clusters. So um, we didn't know how to do something and that resulted in bad things happening for our patient. Um, and now we know, okay, how do we enhance effective communication? They go through the stages in the excavation and then their transform practices in future, this is what I would do. So different students seem to do different things, but th again, this is a high scoring text, 56 out of 60. So it is possible instead of focusing on deficit discourses to focus on, you know, this is what I think I did well as in, in terms of trying to align yourself with particular professional values. So that was what I was looking at. Um, and I have a couple of texts like that. So I just shared one of them. And that's pretty much it from all of us. So um, any questions and comments? Like I said, this part is a lot more work in progress than the others. So any comments um, or any feedback on how to, you know, whether this made sense, this particular constellation and what I can do with it would be very useful. Thank you. Thanks. And I'm just going to say everyone can ask any questions. Oh, this is me after, after the round table collapsed on my computer. Yes, please, anybody, just jump in and um, um, ask the question, or make a comment, or say whatever you whatever comes to mind. I've got one, Molly. I'm actually just um, wondering with the constellation analysis that you've shown us. Mm -hmm. I think I I could follow your thinking and your examples, but in the back of my mind, I'm wondering what's SFLE and what's LCT and how are you, how are you <laughs> those boundaries? So I wasn't particularly clear because the language analysis I was connecting to uh, with, with an SFL framework. So it, could you perhaps say more how you're thinking about that? Um, I'm sorry if that's a horrible question. <laughs> no, no, it's not a horrible question. It's just uh, a, a 
complicated one and one I think that we're asking questions about. But yes, we are looking at, in SFL terms, we're looking at couplings. Um, and I was looking at couplings and how, at a certain point, um, how do those couplings become, in my mind, I don't know, and, and this is something that, um, you know, anyone who's working in axiological constellations might want to jump in and say, there's a point at which that sort of minute level of language analysis, which um, appraisal affords us, is, is interesting for revealing um, the patterns of evaluative meaning, but then trying to think of whether there's an, uh, a larger um, set of meanings in the field that are helping organize these things, you know? So what I was interested in is why does the student choose to engage with these certain sets of, of meanings? For me, couplings becomes clusters once they're stabilized in meaning to a certain extent. So rep repetition um, over time suggests to me, okay, they're becoming more stabilized in meaning. So they seem to be creating a constellation. And as the constellation emerges, does that to me overlap with other types of meaning that are organizing the field or the discipline. So trying to reveal that, I think, is what I was doing. So yes, for me, to a certain extent, the, the entry point is appraisal, the entry point is SFL. But then as I go into the, I don't want to necessarily call it larger, but when I, when I was looking at what are the, the larger sets of, um, the larger sets of uh, principles that are organizing the way in which these clusters come together and make meaning, then I decided, okay, let's look at it in relation to constellations because it makes more sense to me. Is that a... <laughs> so the SFL, but it, I, I mean, I think that makes sense, but I've still got this little feeling which I'm really happy for you to correct and blow out of the water. But the, it's, I feel like the SFL analysis is almost getting repackaged as an LCT constellation in that there's not other LCT analysis that's informing the constellation. And I might be completely out of line with that thought, but that's what I'm struggling with. Okay. Um. Um. Oh, go ahead. Yes. No, oh, go ahead, sir. I'm thinking. I'm thinking of how to respond to that. I just, yeah. Can I um, ask a question or, or just respond um, to Lucy? It's my understanding that it's the analysis of attitude that leads to the identification of the constellation. Is, is that how you understand it, Namala? Yes, that is how I'm looking at it. But... I am, as, as Lucy seems to be saying, I am, we do use um, SFL linguistic analysis to reveal some of those evaluative meanings. I mean, I can look at it in a more generalized way, in patterns of negative charging and, and positive charging and generalize it, but I do choose to look at it in relation to um, the appraisal framework. So I think She's asking about the overlap there. There is definitely an overlap. Carl, help. <laughs> I feel like you need to help me. Oh, I don't want I mean, to. I'm not, yeah. No, I mean, the, um, I think, um, doesn't coupling come with the whole issue about the nature of the meanings being brought together? Um, the, the meanings that are being connected have, um, my brain is completely gone on this front, but um, I'd say that they bring together, so for example, ideation and personal meanings um, into a coupling, whereas uh, constellation doesn't have anything to do with that. But I mean, you could, you could, it might be that normally where you are in your analysis could go, okay, I'm going to go down into, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be in the SFL here and then, and then I'm going to take it down into a sort of the LCT side of things where a constellation is free of any, any code analysis. It's just like what things go together, how they go together, and then you kind of bring in the legitimation codes to start seeing what the cosmology underlying the constellation is. So it's kind of, um, uh, it's not surprising that both theoretical frameworks have something whereby they start thinking about how things are put together into a sort of, you know, 
um, kind of uh, 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 combinations. Um, but you can you can take it down into one or the other depending upon what you're doing. That's what I I mean. That's my guess. Um, and I and I also think just to add to that that maybe couplings is just one aspect, right? One aspect of what an axiological um, cluster could look like. Oh God! I mean, like, yeah, so um, tiny, you would not want to. Way. I think because we're SFLs, we can't unsee that. So that was just our way in. Um, but I know that SFL theory just to, has their own way of, um, you know, talking about what they consider clusterish in terms of bonds and bond networks and icons and syndromes um, and all of the other ways in which they're trying to the ways in which that they're, they're trying to explain how meanings are coming together. And I think for me and Esther more and more, how those meanings stick together. And once they stick together, how they uh, form larger patterns of meaning. So I think that connection between saying, okay, so these are the, you know, this is where we can see the same target, the same kinds of evaluative meaning over and over again but they don't just, that is, it doesn't just stay at that level of that coupling. We ask what kind of a cluster is it building in terms of what's happening in the field or the, on the, or the disciplinary area? So then, okay, what kinds of skills or knowledge or attitude is what I'm arguing in this particular instance? Does that make sense, Lucy? Yeah, I think it's so. It's difficult because it's, it's, it's difficult because I know what you mean. It's just, um, but I don't, I don't need, I didn't really see a conflict in bringing both in. Just a quick thing is I think this is probably another one of these instances where uh, LCT concepts like co-concepts and constellations are incredibly abstract. They're much, much more abstract than, say, for example, system networks and things like that, which are far closer to an empirical object of study. I mean, like, constellations is almost empty. It's like stuff goes together. That's about it. And then, you know, you pile. So it may be that you're using this kind of holding pen for, and now I'm going to, there's constellations. Now I'm going to look at it. You know, I'm really focused on the appraisal front. And then maybe you, you're wanting to hold it open for doing something else. I don't know. But it is a very abstract idea. It's just things go together in a thing. But I mean, it's nice that um, we get this sort of um, chance to be able to swing one way or another with um, these sorts of concepts. And it's not surprising either, since both theoretical frameworks are you know, pretty much engaged with meaning making. I'm going to shut up now. Does anybody else um, have uh, anybody working with like constellations or semantic gravity or um, anything else that um, they're interested in um, asking or discussing or saying? So, sorry, can I ask another question? I, I'm sure. Trying get, I'm trying to get my head around these constellations or axiological ones at the moment, and um, it seems the the evaluator is part of the constellation. Is, is that correct? Is, is that how you see it? So, um, does that, well, does that make sense? In this particular sense? assignment, yes, Grant, because it's a self-reflection, right? So the student is evaluating right. themselves and evaluating everything that's going on, but that's not necessarily... Yeah, so I think in this instance, it's a little bit more complicated because the person is sort of evaluating their own practice. And that's one of the challenges of the assignments. Mm -hmm. The source does come in. I think Jägen has something on that in some of his work um, where he looks at source. So where does the evaluate, evaluation come from? So that adds meaning as well, obviously, in terms of how... Um, the different types of uh, constellations are built up, whether the clusters are opposing each other or likened to each other. So he's got that um, emerging as well, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. I think I was really trying to look for a more sort of systematic way of understanding why the students choose to um, create the, these, these uh, patterns of meaning, because they were so obvious. When I was doing the analysis, it just became very clear that in different parts of the text, repeatedly students were creating these clusters of meaning. And then the question was, what was their basis for doing that? And what is the, what kinds of meanings are they trying to engage with? And I see them as being um, 
informed by this this sort of master document of what it is to be a professional nurse but because like because that is working on such abstract concepts I think revealing the clusters is also an interesting way of seeing how the students try to make it more concrete for themselves right demonstrate their capacity to um, unpack these concepts and apply them in their own clinical placements I don't know I feel like I've left everyone in a deep depressive state deep meditation Andrea <laughs> yes I'm thinking about the students if they um, if you have if you have contacted them about them um, and they and you have received feedback about your rubric today did this kind of approach did they think that it helped them or were they kind of eh, about it Um, actually, we do have a, a we do have a um, feedback form to send out to the students, which we need to do um, soon. But it hasn't been sent out yet, so it would be interesting to see how the students engage with it. I mean, from our own personal experiences, me, Letitia, and Mark, we use these kinds of resources in our teaching all the time um, across multiple different faculty workshops, or whether in our own. Um, whether in our own classes. And we always find that it's very successful and the students give us really positive feedback, in general feedback saying, you know, the concepts made it clear. I've even had students in semesters telling me that they loved semantic gravity, um, that that made everything so much clearer for them. So they'll name the term, um, the meta language, and they'll be very clear about that. So I think we've always had really positive feedback, um, but you're right, it would be very interesting to see whether that's not necessarily the case I, I rarely find that in the Singaporean context that students are averse to knowledge. They like it. They love technicality. They don't have any, they're not afraid of it. I think it's, it's um, they're expected to be good at handling technicalities. And so the more you give them, the, be the more they like it. Um, they prefer that to the sort of abstract, waffly, um, generalized way in which I think a lot of um, subjects are taught to them, particularly academic literacy. You know, this is what good communication is, or you need to become a critical thinker. Or even worse, you are a bad critical thinker because you're Asian, but we will teach you how to become a better critical thinker because we are not. You know, so yeah, but we are definitely going to do a, a feedback form and see how, we, how, what kind of attitudes the students have towards the concepts. Yeah, so Andrea, the, um, we, we did the intervention with the students, uh, last autumn i think or, or am i completely wrong and covid has just no we did we did it was it, it was, was in autumn right this year <laughs> no, no idea anymore no. but the plan is that we're going to now analyze uh their their reflections and then uh do the evaluation as well right to see how they uh how it helped them there's quite a few people here with um, a fair amount of experience of working with people in different subject areas um, uh, i know quite a few people do work with, for example, PD, professional development of, say, for example, science education lecturers at universities. So there's a group at Stellenbosch um, and sort of, uh, Lee, who's here, um, works with sort of, you know, teachers from, teacher, te you know, uh, trainee teachers from across the spectrum. I mean, I mean, I can see that there would be both national and also probably disciplinary aspects to the degree to which they respond to um, technical terms you know like so in the chat earlier on Andrea was saying how in um, in um, a sort of Latin America you get the humanities are uh, generally quite often I think things like history are quite often very humanistic and that can lead to a sort of allergic reaction to terms that sound like they're coming from science for example i should imagine like gravity or density and so on um although the humanities do have a lot of technicality themselves i don't know what other people here find and there's some eap people and um others and so on yeah. i think eap is notoriously uh bad for accepting technicality or so it's uh, i mean susie and joe and everybody else here <laughs> have a lot of stories about about that um 
um, yeah, it makes it quite uh, difficult, but at the same time, um, I think somebody in the chat said the students are often the first ones who say it's useful. And once you kind of use that, you're kind of, no, no one can, can, fight, can fight it. If the students like it, because I remember having a hard time with things like thematic progression, which is such a simple concept, and colleagues not wanting to hear about it, and the students, and Mark had the same uh, um, uh, experience with semantic gravity. But as soon as the students start talking and then they talk to your colleagues about it. And so you have colleagues saying, oh, Mark, I think I have one of your old students. He talked to me about semantic waving. <laughs> and so, yeah, they talk, you just grind them down. <laughs> That's what you have to do. Uh, change from the bottom up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are ways in which you can, like, um, I've always said that LCT is a framework as a very high semantic range and you can work from you know that super ultra sophisticated high highly anal analysis down to the wording level or you can do that which is like you know seriously grounded just straight up moving of a hat um or i think i've seen like trish weeks did a presentation at uh, lct2 where she had, she was talking about how she was using some uh, waving ideas to to teach kids, and the kids were talking. You know, they were using sound as well. She even, she had to put their hands down, middle and up, uh, but and they were also going. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, you can't get simpler than this stuff. Um, so where you meet a code clash of resistance, you know, a subject area or kind of teacher or whatever that is uh, has a different specialization code, probably a different semantic range, um, and is just subject to that kind of dichotomous thinking that believes that you are science cold, dead, technical, positivistic or whatever, or your lovely, you know, warm, uh, holding hands around a bonfire singing kumbaya kind of human humanities. Then, um, when they're subject to that kind of thinking, they will potentially find it quite difficult. And also, by the way, to be fair, teachers have a fuck ton of stuff to do. So the last thing they often want to do is to learn more bloody mm. ideas, uh, which is only fair enough. But one can introduce it, I think, at you know, quite simple levels. Like, for example, you've done one concept, and I think that's a really valuable lesson, you know, in terms of the semantic gravity teaching that's a really valuable lesson not to sort of overload students with um with uh, uh like the whole toolkit you know just one idea gets the point across and you're obviously i mean it's more likely that you will sneak in some semantic density while you're doing it but that doesn't matter mm. it's and a I, very creative kind of what sorry mark go ahead sorry i was gonna say i I've started using semantic density as well with my students. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm only experimenting with that at the moment, but I'll, I'll try that more uh, this semester. Um, but again, I don't see any reason for not using the terminology at all. You know, these students are very clever. Yeah, on the other hand, though, one doesn't have to. I mean, it's not about turning people into LCT people. It's about, you know, um, using um, using whatever the audience can handle as well. So, watch out! Semantic gravity is obviously a gateway drug. But I was wondering if there's any work done on um, kind of um, analysis of types of recontextualization because it seems to me like we're like it's such a dynamic kind of process that we do according to who are our colleagues, who is our manager, who are the legitimate knowers around us, what type of our students. So we kind of intuitively feel, okay, don't say gravity today, or you see what I mean? It's kind of very intuitive how we, we think those guys are not going to like that, those guys are going to like this. And so I just wonder if, uh, you know, I think we should maybe some, some of us kind of try to, if there's a way to conceptualize this to, uh, according to the type of constraints we, we have. Mm -hmm. So some of us can really go high straight away and we know it's going to work. And some of us have just to really work hard <laughs> to, to kind of simplify and you said yeah. intuitive it's not intuitive it's it's a it's the result of a gaze um you know you don't have to sit there analyze and write down stuff to be analyzing so you don't you know you meet someone and you get this stuff in your head 
you know, you get LCT into your, into, as part of your gaze, as part of your way of knowing. And it doesn't just exist as knowledge and concepts. It becomes an internalized yeah. thing. It's knowledge and knowers. It's a way of knowing. And you will chat to someone and think, oh, yeah, right, okay, I've got a, you know, low semantic range, no code person here, sort of like prosaic code, no code, or prosaic no code, if you like. I ain't talking about gravity, you know, semantic gravity um, um, uh, right now. Mm. Um, and then you meet, you know, somebody else and you're just, you're just clicking away the planes in your head thinking, yeah, they're, they're, they're able to deal with the rhizomatic code. They're able to deal with the knowledge code or whatever it might be. I'm going to go full on mm. bucket. I'm going to go epistemic semantic density, epistemological semantic density, you know, like the more syllables, the better for these people. So you know, it's, um, it's it's just internalizing the gaze and so in terms of like a systematic analysis you're kind of doing an analysis as you go when you talk to people and think yeah you know whew, that doesn't really that doesn't really work with them when they kind of face pulse an expression when you yeah, say the you know exactly like, rhizomatic code and they're like oh you know yeah 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 the eye rolls and the uh yeah I know. so i was naively hoping that there could be a kind of a manual <laughs> to just say oh you you're talking to that kind of person here's the well the, the problem the with that is, is this is a really good point is the problem with that is is that nobody and nothing no practice no person nothing is a code so i would never ever say science is a knowledge code because it may not be and in fact in large you know in the big study of new south Wales secondary schools done years ago during the digital education revolution there was a significant minority of uh, a, a significant number of science teachers who who were viewing their subject area as a relativist code which i just couldn't believe but the documents focus groups and everything just reinforced so you never know what you're coming across. So mm -hmm. I would never want a handbook that says, if you meet, you know, if you meet someone from English, they are going to react this way because you don't know. You know, you might have yeah. someone who's come through a portal of time from practical criticism and is just very happy with theoretical stuff. You know, yeah. um, and also nationally, you go from one subject area yeah. to another, from one country to another. Yeah. So it's a dynamic process of analysis of, you know, it's like. But you, you know, I mean, and you know when you're experiencing a clash or a match. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you readjust <laughs> or you go and hide. Mm. Yes, Thank it depends you what you're much. trying to do, whether you're trying to piss people off <laughs> or whether you're trying to engage people productively or whatever it might be. You know, it's like, um, I mean, like uh, many, many years ago when I was very, the world was young and so was I, the, I did a talk at a cultural studies conference in which I basically said British cultural studies was the same as the divine rights of kings and papal infallibility and was like deeply fucking conservative. And I just used we, us a lot and cut out all the theory. And people just going, oh yeah, not, not, that sounds good. You know, so it's like you just follow the code and you'll be fine. <laughs> okay, thank you. We'll keep working at it. Daniel has something to say. Hmm. We've talked with Daniel. Well, I'm sort of I'm sort of sitting here with a little sleeping baby in my arms, so I'll see how I go. But I think I understand Letitia. I think I understand it does more is something about the notion of the recontextualization. Um, we've spoken about this a lot about yeah. the challenges we have of. You know, <laughs> what is it about the context that we're working in that sort of dictate the pieces that we make in those contexts mm -hmm. rather than perhaps a code thing. And I think there's a lot of us who talk about recontextualization, but I'm not sure how many published papers really focus on the logic <laughs> that they go through. I'm really interested in just to join in here is that the kinds of changes we make. So an original term it's repurposed change in some way what kinds of changes are, are we making that's the question um, that i think we could collectively get some traction with that's a brilliant question and that's like uh, that's like a fundamental question of education you know it's like what happens like basil said that every time you move knowledge 
it, you're recontextualizing it and that's a space for ideology what it means really is uh, in today's terms it's like every time you move knowledge you, you're reconfiguring the constellation you know so like i'm trying to write uh, start to write a book uh, which is sort of a bit more introductory to LCT but it's still aimed at producers so I'm in the intellectual field still I'm in the field of production and I'm trying to move it from deeply inside the field of production towards kind of more novices in the field of intellectual production so it's even in the same field and um, even then it requires a certain amount of changing in the kind of constellations of, that things are embedded in you know like i've got rid of all the stuff of uh, I, all the stuff about basil's work because it's not needed here so there's like a whole part of the constellation that's going and so on so and then other things are coming in so even then but let alone moving it towards the you know uh, teaching and learning environment and then different subjects here in the teaching it's basically i think lucy you've just asked the question of education in terms of knowledge practices <laughs> you know like um how how the the things change what do you gain and what do you lose you know um and i think that is the same almost the same, you know I t in, the, it's in a paper that's in a chapter that's not much read uh, uh, in knowledge building about an acting lct in a study of the powerhouse museum and i talk about like um languages of um enactment sort of like translation device to enactment and so it's the same sort of thing as when we translate between a concept and a an object of study translating between a concept and a, a sphere of practice and enacting that concept requires you know we could make that more explicit and that's why i think what Luz is saying we're making we could make that more explicit and say here's the concept here's how we enacted it in this context so it's not just how to analyze it but an enactment a translation device for enactment and this is what it looks like and in that sense, we wouldn't so much lose things as be able to see very clearly, at least in LCT, because the concepts are so abstract, we'd be able to see, okay, how was that concept translated to this enactment here? And that would make it more clear and also probably make us feel a lot better about feeling we've lost something because we've simplified. Mm. I don't know. I'm making that up, but that's what we... That's what we, I did in the, uh, uh, in the paper about Lucilla Cavallo's PhD. Okay, well, we've gone over time. Does anybody else have any um, uh, thoughts? You all look in deep meditative poses. <laughs> That's all I do, Erica, is make sure. So. And I tried so hard to make, like, to do exactly that and to show that in my constellations, but then Carl just you know, did all these amazing gestures. And ah, well, I mean, yeah, you've got like, you've got more things to work with when you're not just doing the printed page. You know, you've got like, a, <laughs> and it's just hard. You're trying to read stuff out and think about what you're talking about. You know, it's a lot easier when you're just in probably. I remember that for next time. Yeah, improv classes are awesome. <laughs> Does anybody have um, um, Anything else apart from me just saying that everybody should take in broad classes because they're so fun? No? Oh, thank you then. So I'm going to say thanks very much to LCT Singapore for an awesome um, uh, discussion. Um, of a, and, and as Steve earlier on was writing, had to run off, but he was writing about how jealousy was of the buy-in that you've got at the National University of Singapore. So I think that's great when you're able to work with colleagues and they're really buying in and keen. I mean, that's really, that's a sort of an ideal space in which to work. Um, so that's great. And, and particularly with colleagues who have got problems, a problem that they want solved or help with. That's ideal as far as I'm concerned. And that's what LCT is all about. It's, it's not about modeling anything. It's about trying to solve problems. So um, that's, I mean, wonderful. So thanks everybody. It's a sort of silent clap of Zoom. The silent clap of Zoom. <laughs> thank you everyone i think that's a part of the tolkien universe um <laughs> thanks everybody and i hope to see you all for uh um season two if i'm gonna do one i can't remember now um i'm pretty sure i was season two of uh the core center online roundtable 
And I hope to see you all there and I'll be in touch about LCT 3.5 soon. Thank you very much, everyone.